Happening now, what we know about the continuing investigation into Friday's massive fire here in Jamestown. Plus, a motorcyclist airlifted from an early morning crash, the latest there. Well, that humidity is not going anywhere, and we already have some showers and storms popping up. Those will continue tomorrow. We'll talk about it in detail next as the news at noon starts now. Live and on demand, this is WNY News Now. City of Jamestown fire crews worked into the night Friday battling a massive blaze at what was Jamestown Royal Upholstery Company on East Crescent Street. Thank you for joining us for WNY News Now. I'm Justin Gould. Fire companies were first called to the scene around 7 o'clock for reports of massive smoke and flames coming from the old factory that once produced furniture. Mayor Eddie Sunquist telling us this is quite possibly one of the largest fires the city has seen in recent history. This fire was really hot. It's melted siding and other parts of other buildings around it. Uh, and so we're working uh, very hard to make sure that our, our folks are safe. In total, all available personnel from the Jamestown Fire Department was called to the scene, along with several neighboring departments providing aid. As mentioned by the mayor, the heat of the fire was a big challenge for first responders. When the initial arriving companies responded here, the building was still standing and a lot of it has collapsed down due to the heat of the fire. Since then, an emergency demolition has been ordered, which will bring down the remaining structure. But Chief Kuhn says before the demo, crews will be searching the scene. As we go through and try to mop up hot spots, we'll be checking to make sure that there's been no uh, no injuries associated with, a, with this place. J.C. Moore, who lives nearby, first noted some Something was wrong when she saw a plume of black smoke billowing above her house. Additionally, she says some debris fell from the sky. We had like large pieces of debris like this big. And then there was also like small pieces that were like paper. We found some like burned pages that had letters on them still like like writing. Um, and then there was like other pieces that looked like almost to be part of like the roof or something that was like it was ash but it wasn't ash that fell apart when you touched it it was still a whole like piece that smoke spotted as far as Cattaraugus County and even on Doppler radar now as for what caused the fire well that's still up for debate joining us live in studio with more on our team coverage of this story is Julia Gress Julia what's the latest there well Justin investigators are continuing to seek what caused that massive fire the fire, which Jamestown Fire Chief Matthew Kuhn says burned incredibly hot, impacted nearby homes and businesses, including a plumbing business across the street. The owner of the shop, who did not want to appear on camera for an interview this morning, tells us the Jamestown BPU have set up a temporary generator to restore power to his shop, which sustained some fire damage. Now that the blaze has been extinguished, an emergency demolition team has brought down the remaining structure. However, before that happened, Chief Kuhn says crew spent some time searching the rubble. As of airtime, we are still awaiting a call back from the fire department with more details about their continued investigation. However, those living in the area explain the impact this fire will have moving forward. It's a building that I, myself and my fiance have talked about a lot um, about, you know, how we think that it could be utilized for other things in this town. And so, yeah, it's it's definitely a huge thing that's and I think this day is not going to be forgotten in Jamestown. The structure, which at one point symbolized Jamestown's long-standing history in the furniture industry, has been an eyesore for many in the community over the past recent years, with residents telling us the dilapidated building was home to, in some cases, unwanted illicit activities. Live in studio, Julia Gress, WNY News Now. A motorcyclist was taken via medical helicopter to a regional hospital following a mid-morning crash in the city of Jamestown today. According to fire dispatch reports, the female motorcyclist was riding in the area of East 2nd and Windsor Streets when she was hit by a vehicle around 9.20 this morning. Jamestown Police, the Jamestown Fire Department, and All-Star EMS responded to that scene. Medics on location while radioing dispatch reported she was ejected over the handlebars of her bike during the crash. Around 9.30, the woman was taken to the helipad at UPMC Chautauqua Hospital to be airlifted via Stat Medevac. Well, Chautauqua County's hazmat team has a new warning for pool owners this summer. The group specifically trained of firefighters say due to chlorine shortages nationwide, some pool owners are...
being forced to switch to brands they've never used before. That's why the county's hazardous materials response team is urging owners to not mix different forms of chlorinating products. The reason, officials say, mixing those different compounds can produce toxic vapors. Furthermore, exposure to those fumes may cause airway irritation, coughing, shortness of breath, and or chemical burns to the eyes or skin. Pool owners that are unsure of what products they should use are encouraged to read the labels or consult their pool supply vendor. Well, we thank you for joining us for WNY News Now. And as we head into the summer season out there, a lot of people probably going to be wanting to hit the pools, especially today. Good to see uh, Chris. Good to see Wendy. Good to see Rita, uh, Peggy, and uh, Gina as well. Hopefully you all are having a great day. We appreciate you tuning in. Uh, speaking of the heat and the reason why we'd all want to be in the pool, she forecaster Dakota Hunter joining us live with a first look at our weather and that's not a pool behind you, Dakota, but people might be trying to hit Finley Lake for some relief today. Yes, I mean, you know, today you're going to be dodging a few showers and storms out there. It's those whack-a-mole type of storms. But yeah, the water or the lakeshore is really going to be the place to be. This is a live look over Finley Lake. Wanted to show you the clouds for one reason. These are towering cumulus clouds. Notice how they're extending up into the sky. That's because of thunderstorm development. And we'll show that to you on the radar. We're already seeing these pop-up showers and storms already as of noon hour and these are going to continue in coverage through the afternoon now again the one thing about these is something we talk about all the time we can't tell you when or where it's going to rain this afternoon just understand that there is a chance for these showers and storms to pop up throughout the afternoon and the best chance for them is mainly going to be across the southern tier today so again you know as we always say when thunder roars head indoors and uh, there could be some heavy rainfall out of these as well 84 was the high yesterday we didn't officially make it into the mid 80s because the wind helped us to keep us a little bit cooler but we only managed 70 as the low this morning that's where we started the day 95 and 39 are the record highs and lows and basically with the humidity in play we're going to keep the chance of rain basically in the forecast throughout much of this week so yeah just get used to the warmth and the humidity because it's not going anywhere. Partly to mostly sunny today, scattered showers and storms develop through the afternoon. Very warm with near tropical humidity. 76, that's right at the immediate Lake Erie waterfront to 87 while inland with a southwest wind 6 to 12 miles per hour. Tomorrow is going to be another rinse and repeat, but is there any sign? of cooler air. We'll talk about it with that seven day later in the show. Justin. Well, I certainly hope so, Dakota. We'll stay tuned Ooh, to that baby. coming up 10 minutes time. Yeah. Talk about it. It's hot out there. Well, those tasked with finding a solution to control the rapidly growing white-tailed deer population in Jamestown will likely make a decision on what to do in the coming months. As WNY News Now's Jason Rutman reports, the City Deer Management Work Group met last week to continue this nearly year-long discussion on the subject. Among those in attendance at last week's meeting was Cayuga Heights Mayor Linda Woodard, who offered her expertise to the committee. Having faced an overpopulation of deer in her area and successfully brought their numbers down. She discussed her experience using a professional hunting company, but noted that it was an expensive investment. In fact, she said they paid roughly $27,000 for three nights of work. I think they got 17 or 18 deer. So it's not cheap. It, it just isn't cheap, but we don't, we don't have a, um, an alternative. Woodard explained that before the culling program began, there were 125 deers per square mile in her area. Now, that number is down to approximately nine. Another option discussed would be to set up times in which volunteer hunters could kill deer, which seemed to be what the group was leaning towards. That almost every other municipality in the area does use uh, volunteer hunters. Um, and they have um, varying amounts of success. It really depends on who you have doing the hunting and how dedicated they are. It does work. Uh, it is cost effective, but it doesn't necessarily um, reduce the deer population to, to the point where you're not going to get complaints from residents who have their vegetation being destroyed. The committee is eyeing controlled hunts with volunteer hunters in local parks with ample distance from houses, likely in late November or December. They also plan on telling hunters not to shoot unless they know for sure that deer won't be able to sprint away while injured, which could pose a risk to city residents.
I'd say 90% of the people I talk to have support for a controlled hunt. Moral and ethical questions were accounted for as well. I would even go as far as to say we could take, could take fawns too. I know that's another sensitive subject for some people, but you know, when you're talking about the wildlife management, it's, it's kind of what you have to do. It was noted that decreasing the deer population to a more reasonable number isn't going to be a quick affair. It's going to be a, a, a few year process to, to thin the herd out and get it back down to a manageable number where the ecosystem can support that and you don't have deer coming deep into the city. Public service announcements will also likely be released explaining why the deer need to be called. People are at a kind of a breaking point. They want something done about it. Jason Rutman, WNY News Now. Jason, thank you. The next step, according to that group, would be to hold a public hearing on the issue and then vote to move forward with hunts or not at some point this fall. If the voting results are approving their plan, the Department of Environmental Conservation would be contacted in order to get permission for the endeavor. Well, Johnson & Johnson has agreed to pay $230 million to settle an opioid lawsuit from the state of New York. The state attorney general announced that settlement over the weekend. The money J&J has agreed to cough up will go towards prevention and treatment of opioid addiction. Johnson & Johnson also won't be allowed to make or sell opioids in New York. A company spokesperson says it decided last year to stop selling the pain medications in the United States completely. In 2019, New York's AG filed a lawsuit claiming Johnson & Johnson, along with other pharmaceutical companies, engaged in deceptive marketing and did not do enough to prevent opioids from falling into the wrong hands. J&J has been hit hard by opioid-related lawsuits, including a $572 million verdict in Oklahoma and an ongoing case in California. Well, coming up next, a lot more to tell you about. A bipartisan infrastructure deal is expected to move forward, the latest from Washington at this hour. But first, Governor Cuomo continues to receive donations despite allegations of wrongdoing. What supporters of his have to say. Stay with us as WNY News Now continues. With coverage that matters, this is WNY News Now. Located along the Amish Trail, the Randolph Retail Company offers a variety of clothing, jewelry, and gifts for any occasion. Offering uptown merchandise at small town prices, our locally owned business balances quality and value. With complimentary gift wrap here at the Randolph Retail Company, we pride ourselves in personal service. Check out our Facebook page or stop in today at 127 Main Street, Randolph, just a 20 minute drive from Jamestown. EagleZip.com is your local one-stop shop for all of your home and business computer needs. Located on Fluvanna Avenue Extension, just outside of Jamestown, EagleZip.com sells and services all brands of desktops and laptops, as well as servers and network equipment for your business. All new computer sales include transferring your data from your old computer, plus a two-year warranty. Call EagleZip.com today. Stop by EagleZip.com today and let us make computers easy for you. Honest John says what you're looking for When you want it good, we're gonna give you lots more from freshly made subs to the best of pizza and wings, Honest John's has what you're looking for. And now two great locations, East 2nd Street and Fairmount Avenue. Order takeout or delivery today online at honestjohns.pizza. You're gonna get it good at Honest John's. Have the best summer ever with endless adventures at Girl Scout Summer Camp. Financial aid available, open to all girls. For more information, call or go to gswny.org. You're watching WNY News Now, where coverage comes first. Well, despite numerous sexual harassment allegations, some donors continue to show loyalty to Governor Andrew Cuomo. The governor's reputation has taken a downturn by allegations he sexually harassed women and then misled the public about COVID-19 deaths in nursing homes. 
Investigations into allegations that Cuomo sexually harassed employees and other women, groped a current female aide, unlawfully used state resources for a $5. million book deal, and minimized the state's death toll of COVID-19 among nursing home residents are currently all underway while Cuomo denies any wrongdoing. However, the Democratic Party's most reliable contributors say they will still donate to his campaign for his fourth term in office. These contributors, including Larry Rockefeller, the Republican nephew of former Governor Nelson Rockefeller and great-grandson of Standard Oil founder John D. Rockefeller, says that there's due process in this country and he'll continue to add to nearly $166,000 donated to Cuomo's campaign since 2009. Though Cuomo resisted numerous calls for his resignation last March from, March from a majority of state and federal Democratic lawmakers, polling still suggests that the governor has lost some support within his party. The full picture of whether the allegations will hurt Cuomo with contributions might become clearer on July 15th, when his campaign has to disclose donations made since January of this year. Well, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin says he believes a bipartisan version of President Joe Biden's infrastructure bill will pass Congress. The massive package has taken center stage on Biden's agenda for weeks as Democrats and Republicans struggle to reach a compromise. That finally happened last week, though, when Biden agreed to a bipartisan deal. Well, now the question is if he can get the 60 votes needed to pass the Senate. Manchin, who is known as a moderate, says he believes he can. The bipartisan deal earmarks $1.2 trillion for various infrastructure projects nationwide. That's significantly less than Biden's original $2.5 trillion proposal. It appears to set aside Biden's plan to raise corporate income taxes from 21% to 28%. Uh, We're talking about the biggest federal commitment for public transit ever, uh, the most committed to passenger rail since Amtrak was created in the first place, some of the biggest investments on roads and bridges since the Eisenhower administration, getting lead out of the pipes uh, that take water to American children, making sure everybody's able to have affordable and fast internet. Uh, It's a major, major opportunity to really set America up to succeed. Now, rising taxes is a major sticking point for Republicans, but Manchin says he's willing to raise the corporate income tax rate 25 percent. If the deal can't get the needed votes, Democrats can try to push it through using the budget reconciliation process, which only requires a majority. Well, rescue crews from around the world are descending upon the coastal town of Surfside, Florida, as families await any news about their missing loved ones following a devastating condo collapse last Thursday. At least nine are dead and 152 remain unaccounted for. Rescuers are racing the clock to find survivors there. Daryl Forges is in Surfside, Florida with the latest. The search for survivors intensifying as rescuers comb the rubble for the fifth day. We want to keep maximum pressure, maximum staffing, maximum rescue people on that mound looking for people to pull them out alive. With weather conditions improving, crews are hopeful they can make more progress, aided in part by a trench. Fires blazing beneath the mass of concrete have finally been put out, but the instability of the debris still posing a threat to the response. They're still laboring under very dangerous circumstances. They're highly motivated to find people, uh, but the conditions are very difficult. While questions mount over what caused the Champlain Tower's south condominium to collapse, survivors describe the moments the building began to fall. Seeing the walls and and how badly and violently they swayed, um, I honestly don't know how it didn't come down when we were startled, um, basically out of our sleep. Grateful they got out in time. At that moment where it really hit me that um, we were racing against time to get to the bottom of the uh, building before the entire thing came down. But with more than 100 people still missing, the situation grows more desperate by the hour. It is unimaginable grief mixed with hope, anxiety, frustration. As the community holds out hope for signs of life. I expect miracles. I'm expecting many miracles. In Surfside, I'm Daryl Forges. Daryl, thank you. Surfside Mayor Charles Burkett says he'll release all city documents related to that condo. An engineering firm will begin inspecting the other towers nearby starting Tuesday. 
Well, grab your flannel shirts and axes because it's National Paul Bunyan Day. What is that? Well, the legendary lumberjack is known and celebrated across America every year today on June 28th. The mythical giant was known for brandishing a gigantic axe and always being accompanied by his trusty sidekick, Babe the Big Blue Ox. Now, some of Paul's most famous works include the creation of the Grand Canyon in Arizona, the pungent sound in the Pacific Northwest, and the Black Hills in South Dakota, along with some other lakes and rivers, too. Well, today his legacy is honored with statues, amusement parks, and even a animatronic ride in the Mall of America in Minnesota. If you're looking for a way to celebrate Bunyan's legacy, you can have a flat jack or pancake for lunch or dinner today. Those were among his favorites. Mm -mm -mm. It's like they always do this to us. They have the food segments uh, or something related to food right before lunch. We thank you for joining us for WNY News. Now let us know uh, what you think about these stories and more in the comments down below. It's uh, good to see Jason. Good to see uh, Erleen, good to see Alexis and uh, Joey as well. Hopefully we're all having a great day out there. Uh, Dakota now joining us with a full look at our weather forecast. And I know today, Dakota, the big story is the amount of heat that is not just impacting us here in western New York, but in other places around the country. Yeah, too. I mean, parts of the Pacific Northwest, parts of Seattle and parts of Washington State, have gone over 100 degrees and they're forecast for another 100 plus degree day today. I mean, the heat like that in the Pacific Northwest, you just don't think of that. I mean, it's unimaginable. So it makes our heat looks like crap compared yeah, to this. This is nothing. Yeah, I know. This is nothing. <laughs> I mean, you know, today 84 will be a forecast high, 85 tomorrow. We start to back it down as we go to the middle of the week going into uh, the end of the week here as we start to see the humidity finally starting to pull back. But the bigger issue is going to be the heat index or the feels like temperature. So, to, so uh, today the peak heat index will likely be around 92 degrees. So this is what it's going to feel like because we have near tropical humidity today. Dew points are all already in the 70s in many locations and that's the air you can wear you can just take off your clothes and streak okay don't do that but uh, you could basically do that with the air we have today 90 will be the heat index tomorrow and then again you'll see it backing down as we go into the later part of the week as the humidity finally starts to recede 82 right now here in town as a noon hour 83 climber 82 fredonia 83 dunkirk 82 randolph 81 and olean 85 already over in erie but when you factor in the humidity this is what it feels like these are the current heat indices or the feels like temperature 83 here in town 88 in climber 86 in fredonia 88 in Randolph, already 90 in uh, Erie and, oh, and uh, Warren, already 92 there. So that's what it feels like. So be prepared for that. The heat index is not 74 in Dunkirk. That's an error with the ASOS station there in uh, the uh, Dunkirk airport. So, hey, tonight, if you're looking for something to do, we do have the Tarp Skunks back at home tonight. They are playing the Red Wings uh, tonight at 7 o'clock. And we are hopeful that any of those showers and storms will end before game time tonight. But it will be mild and muggy. 82 degrees down to 78 by the ninth inning. So hopefully we'll be able to get that game in. We're hopeful that uh, any of those showers and storms will hopefully end before game time. So here is the radar right now. You'll be able to see those showers. This is that little shower that I showed you on the uh, Finley Lake camera earlier. It's actually moving to the northeast. And these are going to be popping up through the day today in random locations. And the big driving weather factor is a big dome of high pressure that's actually off the uh, northeast coast. And speaking off the northeast coast, we have our fourth tropical depression right now off the South Carolina coastline going into Georgia. This may bring us some precipitation later in the week. It's going to pass to our south based on the new model guidance, but uh, we may see some moisture out of that system later in the week. So here's Future Scan. It paints you those showers and thunderstorms. Now, again, they're not going to pop up in this exact location. This is just a computer simulation, but you get the idea that showers and storms will pop up through the day. Tonight should be mainly dry, but it's going to be another mild and muggy night. So AC's on, windows open.
kind of night. Tomorrow, a repeat. We start dry, scattered showers and thunderstorms pop up in the afternoon in random locations, and then they go to bed for tomorrow night, and then we'll do it all again as we go into Wednesday. So the zone forecast, inland areas, this is where the high temperatures will likely be. This is computer model data, so it might be going a bit too high here, but definitely mid to upper 80s is possible. It's whack-a-mole storms through the afternoon. If you played whack-a-mole, you know how frustrating of a game that is. The next seven days are right on the screen right now. 85 tomorrow, 80 on Wednesday, even more showers and storms. Well, we basically just repeat it on Thursday. Then the humidity starts to back down along with the rain chances. So we're hopeful Independence Day will be dry, but we do have a few scattered showers in the forecast right now. Stay tuned on that. We'll be right back. With coverage that matters, this is WNY News Now. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. Testicular cancer is the leading form of cancer in men aged 15 to 35. One in 250 men will be diagnosed with testicular cancer. But 98% will survive if detected early. As a survivor, I believe early detection is the key. Learn how to do a testicular self-exam and other important facts about testicular cancer at oneball4tc.com. You're watching WNY News Now, your source for breaking news. We have friends and family of Jamestown High School's class of 2021 gathered to celebrate accomplishments of graduating students over the weekend at the Chautauqua Institution. Our Lee Kane was speaking with some of the students about what that day meant to them. This is Lee Kane with Western New York News Now. It was an exciting evening this past Friday as the Jamestown High School class of 2021 was able to celebrate with an in-person ceremony after much uncertainty. We managed to find a few seniors in the JHS a cappella and ask them a few questions. How does it feel to be performing live in the first graduation of students? It's kind of like really, really exciting, but also like sensitive because we've never had this experience. So it's like really nice to do this, especially because a lot of us are in college. What advice do you have for the upcoming class? Definitely show up to school as often as possible because there were a lot of days I missed and I regret it. There's always something new going on and catching up after you miss is so hard. So keep up on that homework and go as often as you can. Have you felt anything yes. different since you've been back? I definitely think that I appreciate the experiences that I, I get to have now more since I didn't get to have them last year. And it's a lot more it's definitely a lot less than one day. It's a lot more. I appreciate every moment that we get to see the acapella or because we didn't have the experiences last year. Afterwards. As more graduates and their families started filling in, we managed to snag an interview with JHS principal Dana Williams and ask his thoughts on the ceremony. Mr. Williams, how does it feel to have an in-person graduation ceremony for the first time in a couple of years? I couldn't be happier. Yeah, just up to a couple weeks ago, I was you know, kind of worried that we were going to have to do two ceremonies, which again, we were happy with, but then all of a sudden the restrictions were kind of lessened a little bit and we were able to come here and have one ceremony with all the graduates, all their guests here at Chautauqua, and you know, I, couldn't, I couldn't be happier for all these, all, everyone that's going to come here tonight. It's the way it really should be. and. All graduates of Jamestown High School should have the opportunity to walk the stage here at Chautauqua. And that's actually one thing I did want to ask you is, we know with the CDC guidelines, just all of us, they're all over the place. How did you guys manage to pull this off? I hear the, the famed Jamestown acapella that's been around for, right. you know, I mean, it's been all over the world. Um, and when I was here, it was Mr. Bogey. Right. But uh, how did you guys manage to pull this off so quickly? Well, again, we were planning for two ceremonies here. So two ceremonies was gonna be a big, big challenge, a lot more planning. So actually when they went to one ceremony here, it was much easier to put together. Like you said, we have our acapella. Unfortunately, our, our, our band didn't have time to prepare, so they're not here. But you mentioned Brian Bogey, he's here. He's gonna be playing a lot of music. He's gonna be playing the organ and the processional. So again, it, it came together a lot easier and we had a lot of really, really good help from some, from some people with a lot of experience. So. Right, again, our Lee Kane reporting, absolutely incredible. And 
You know, a lot of schools, not just Jamestown, but all over the weekend, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we're, we're able to celebrate that for the first time in what feels like forever mm-hmm. to be able to be together. So it, it really is, really is amazing. So congratulations to all the JSH kids and Go Raiders. Falconer kids and Southwestern kids and Casadega Ooh, and Southwestern. And I could just go on and on. I don't hate Southwestern. I'm just, you know, I'm a graduate of JHS. He's got that rivalry. And JHS compete, that rivalry. So. We'll leave there you with is. this live shot over downtown. Have a great day. Everybody.